Welcome back to the State of Play. Now, she was without a doubt the rising star of opposition politics, the youngest leader of the official opposition in Parliament, the first black woman to occupy that position. That was until she dropped a bombshell on the eve of the 2014 elections, announcing she was quitting her DA position in favor of a one-year sabbatical at Harvard University. So impactful was that resignation to this day when DA leaders, especially Especially black leaders resign, it's not uncommon to hear people quip, oh, he or she is going to Harvard. But Lindy Wemazibugo has since moved on from that chapter of her life and has over the last few years been pursuing her passion for developing public leaders through her apolitical academy. Lindy Wemazibugo is my second guest tonight here on the State of Play. Friends, Democrats, we have all seen in my home province of Guazulu Natal where the money goes when it's not spent of delivering to the people. It is spent on building a palace worth 249 million rand for President Jacob Zuma. A palace where President Zuma's cows live in more security than the people of the province of Guazulu Natal. A palace where his chickens live more luxuriously than the people of South Africa who elected him. A luxury estate where swimming pools, helipads, amphitheaters, and multi-million rand air conditioners are considered security features for the president. Democrats, we deserve better. All right, Lindy Wamazibuga, thank you so much for coming through. So talk to me. I mean, we were watching that clip of you from May 2014, mm. and you were ended there by saying we deserve better. Mm. In the year, almost two years now, of you running the Apolitical Academy, how do you assess um, the extent to which it has contributed to ensuring that we get that better that we deserve? So what's wonderful about a political academy is we are focused on getting great leaders across the political spectrum. We are not focused on empowering one political party at the expense of the other. And we're also very interested in supporting people from outside politics and government who want to go into independent institutions like the Auditor General's Office, um, the Independent Electoral Commission. So there are many people in this country who want to participate in public service but are not interested in a T-shirt or a beret. They actually want to be independent and public servants. So it has been really wonderful to see fellows from the private sector, people who've got, come from civil society leadership, and people who are already within the public sector advancing their careers after graduating from this program. But is it possible to bring about that impact that you, you are targeting, ethical, um, transformational, young leadership, women leadership, uh, that impacts you know, the trajectory of countries um, while still being apolitical? So we as an organization are apolitical, but we are not disinterested in politics. Sure. And in fact, each of our classes of fellows is made up of people from diverse backgrounds. So we've accepted onto this program fellows who identify with or are members of the ANC, the NFP, the DA, the EFF. It's a SADC program, so we've had fellows from ZANU, from MDC, from SWAPO, from a variety of political organizations or governments throughout the SADC region. Um, and I think it is absolutely possible. It's possible for one man or one woman to destroy a country, right? It's definitely possible for 25, then 50, then 75, then 100, and so on, people to make a major, major impact, particularly in elected leadership, but also in political appointments. And so we know that we have ministers, heads of government in provinces and at national level who yeah. desperately need technical capacity in order to deliver on their political mandate. And a lot of these candidates um, between the ages of 20 and 45 are the right people to give that support. So why do you teach them? Uh, well, is it basics such as, you know, 
public speaking and, and, and fundraising and those kind of things? So we include a lot of skills building, but we focus very much on what we call personal leadership skills. We have a belief that a lot of the problems we experience in politics today are because we have thin-skinned politicians, and we have them all over the world. People who shoot from the hip, who are insecure, who've got low self-esteem, but also who haven't gotten to grips with who they are, what they want, why they want to serve. And so we focus very, very deeply and initially on making sure that our fellows understand their public purpose, why they want to serve, and also connect with their sense of ethics. Ethics is a very nebulous term. Some people think being ethical is just not breaking the law, but it's so much more than that. Um, and so we encourage our fellows to connect with their history, their personal history, the history of their country, and understand what it is they're trying to do to make uh, public leadership better. And then only do we do the systems learning where we sort of do comparative politics on the political systems in the class. Us, um, as well as skills building, all the things you mentioned, from media to fundraising, mm. to how to bring together constituencies of people across difference to make, a, to make a change. But in a country like ours, is it possible for individuals, you know, having gone through with, with the kind of aspirations that you describe, mm. ethical, transformational, young, energetic, it, does our system of politics, for instance, make it possible for that kind of leader to emerge and, and, and mm. you know to use a term that's used in politics political balance to emerge mm -hmm. and actually take the reins as opposed to um, shifting gears uh, just being responsible for shifting gears but actually steering uh, the actual vehicle that we are in I believe it is I, I, what I've what I found in the outreach we've had to do and the outreach we had to do for a year before we even started this program is that there are centers of excellence in every political party in every government mm. and there are centers of mediocrity so one of the things that's a big portion of this program is intergenerational dialogue we invite cabinet ministers, civil servants, public leaders, people who are working in the sector to come and address our fellows and interact with them from a range of political backgrounds. And what's special about this program is if you do a DA or an EFF or an ANC program, you only meet leaders from those parties, whereas we encourage dialogue that cuts across political affiliation. And it creates opportunities for younger generation of leaders to interrogate the issues of the past, how we came to be where we are, but also to understand the complexity. And what has come out of those relationships that are built over the course of the year is that many of the people who are already in government meet these young people, interact with them, bring them onto their teams, recommend them for roles. There's a lot of um, sort of mentorship mm. that goes on between the generations on our program and it's an incredibly deliberate process because we believe young people should enter the system but they should also be aware of what has come before them. All right, Lindy, I think I'd be failing then if I didn't ask you specific questions about the politics, opposition politics mm. and I don't think you are ready to tell us the full story uh, about your departure and I, I suppose we'd need a whole hour for that if not two hours or three hours. But tell me the state of the Democratic Alliance and opposition politics. Mm. If you were new to the DA and someone was recruiting you to the DA currently mm. Mm. with everything that has gone before in the last 12 months or so, mm. would you join the DA? Uh, probably not. No. Why? Um, I think it's quite clear that there's been an exodus of some of the most talented people in that organization. I think it's clear that it's been captured by a certain faction of the party. And often when that happens, when a party can't accommodate diverse voices, people who like to challenge, who like to bring fresh ideas, who like to, you know, not just kowtow to the status quo, tire of fighting every single day um, and eventually move on to greener pastures. So I think there's a challenge amongst all opposition parties where there are these dominant factions that make it impossible to challenge for power, to challenge for leadership, to challenge the status quo. And as a result, my view is that opposition politics is actually in crisis right now. In crisis? And I think I saw um, just recently, I think it was Tony Leon that talked about if it's not growing, it's dying. Yeah. What's your assessment then of the DA, growing or dying? Well, look, the ANC has been in decline since 1999, if I'm not mistaken. That was when they peaked at almost 70%. So I think it's unfair to define decline as death. You know, it's not an immediate death. But it is true that, uh, you know, the, the party went backwards under Tony. It went back under Musi Maimane as well. Um, and, but I think political parties can bounce back from that. I don't think it's a terminal thing. 
My concern is about the extent to which difference is tolerated in political organizations. So yeah. you see in parties like the EFF, how can I feel like I'm part of a democratic project if I can't contest for power at the highest levels, right? How can I feel, even in the DA, you know, some of the criticism I've heard of Mbali Nduli contesting for the leadership, you know, has implied that she kind of has no right to challenge the incumbency. Um, political parties that don't have a thriving internal democratic culture can't aspire to govern democratically. All right, Lindy, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. That's Lindy Mazibugo talking to me about the work of her, her a political academy and of course getting some sense on what she's thinking about the current issues that we face in the country particularly in opposition politics on that note that's the state of play for this week join us again next time because politics is too important to be left to politicians